Hey guys, Smith Marusik here, and in this video, we're going to talk about a summary of titration curve shapes. Now, in our last several videos, you have been calculating with and constructing all kinds of various titration curve combinations. What we're going to do here is we're going to look at those combinations all together so that we can note some similarities and differences in the curves themselves. Now, we are going to look at here four combinations of acid with base. However, in all four of these, you will notice that the acid is the analyte and the titrant is the base. Um, if you were to flip-flop that, uh, what you would see is mere images of all of these graph shapes. However, the traits that we're going to talk about would be exactly the same. So let's start off here with a strong acid and a strong base. Um, you will notice our general S shape that we always see with the titration curve. However, you notice at the equivalence point, we have a pretty dramatic change that happens there in our pH at that point. And at that point exactly, we would have a pH of 7 on the nose. Um, also, one other thing I want to point out that's a little more minor, but is still something to notate. Notice that our starting pH and our ending pH are pretty extreme, and that has to do with the strong acid, strong base nature to those substances. So now let's say we take this strong acid and replace it with a weak acid and look at that graph. Um, first off, you notice that around the equivalence point, we get a less dramatic change of our pH level. Also, the equivalence point itself is actually higher than 7. Now, you have to be really careful for the reasoning on this. I have a lot of people that want to reason this out by saying, well, the strong base wins out, and so therefore the pH is slightly basic. Now, while it might be true that you have a strong base and the pH is slightly basic, that's not the reason. The reason actually has to do with this weak acid. When I have a weak acid, even though at equilibrium these two will cancel each other, out, you are going to have the conjugate base of the weak acid present. And so because you have the conjugate base present here, that gives you a pH slightly higher than 7. Now, a couple other things to point out. These are super minor, but just something to kind of notate. Um, first off, on our S shape, you'll sometimes notice over here where we have a lot of that weak acid, we get more of a curvature versus kind of a straight across. Um, and that has to do, again, with the fact that we have that weak acid there and the equilibrium that's existing that can cause some fluctuations in our numbers. Also, you'll notice while on the base end of things, your pH is extreme, on the acid end here, your pH is not as extreme, again, because of the weak acid. So now, let's flip the tables here. Let's instead talk about a strong acid with a weak base. Again, we see that less dramatic increase of pH around the equivalence point. We also notice an equivalence point that's below 7. And again, that has to do with a conjugate partner. When I have a weak base, at equilibrium, these two cancel each other out, but there will be some conjugate acid of the weak base still remaining. And that conjugate acid is what causes that pH to be lower than 7. So be really careful there. Um, again, Notice that while on the acid end of things, your pH is extreme. However, on the base end of things, we're not very extreme, like we're nowhere near that 14. Um, and so that would be an indication, again, that you might have a weak base being present there. Now, this last combination here, weak acid with weak base. I have really good news. You do not have to calculate this type of graph in AP. Thank goodness, and I'm going to tell you why. These get really complicated, just like we saw we had equilibrium when we had a weak acid with a strong base. Or here, we had equilibrium with the weak base when we had the base with the strong acid. Here, you would have equilibrium with both things. <laughs> and that would make for some very complicated calculations. Good times. However, let's notice the shape of things. First off, we do get an increase around the equivalence point. However, this time it's almost flat. Like it, it hardly has any dramatic nature to it at all. Um, the pH of the equivalence point ends up around 7. It depends on is 
the weak acid slightly stronger or is the weak base slightly stronger? And again, that would require a lot of equilibrium calculations in order to really figure out what in the world is happening there. So good news that we don't have to do that. So let's fill in some blanks down here um, that summarize some of the things from up above. It says when titrating a strong base and a strong acid, the pH of the equivalence point is 7 on the nose. However, if we change to a weaker acid, so that means the base is strong, um, then the pH of the equivalence point is a value higher than 7. The reason why is because there's going to be some conjugate base present at equilibrium because of the equilibrium that that weak acid would do. So we have to be really careful with that. Also, if we change to a weak base, so the acid was strong, then that means the pH of the equivalence point is a value lower than 7. Why? Because again, that conjugate acid would be present of the weak base, even though we are at the equivalence point. So we have to be really careful on our justifications for that. This is what kind of words you would want to use if you were justifying why a pH was higher or lower than 7 at equilibrium. You want to talk about the conjugate partner being present at equilibrium. Now, as we already said, a weak acid and a weak base usually has a pH around 7. Um, if the Ka of the acid is greater than the Kb of the base, that means that the acid is slightly stronger, and so the solution would be slightly acidic at the equivalence point, and the pH would be slightly lower than 7. If the Kb of the base was greater, then of course all of this would be opposite. Um, I'll be honest, I don't think you'll get asked about that ever, but just in case you were curious, that would be how it works. All right, with that said, let's go ahead and look at the next page. All right, they gave us a 30 milliliter sample of 0 0.05 molar solution of hydrogen carbonate, which is titrated with 0 0.05 molar of hydrochloric acid HCl. And our eventual goal here is that we are going to want to construct a titration curve for this particular substance. Now, they are not going to require us here to do all the calculations like we've done in our previous videos for all kinds of various points on the curve. Um, we're going to be given some data here, and I'm going to show you some tricks we can use to get other components of the data. So the first thing that they want us to do here is to calculate the volume of acid needed to reach the equivalence point. Now, to do this, what you first actually need is a reaction. And the reason why is because I need to know my moles to moles ratio within that reaction to be able to plug in that ratio into some stoichiometry. So the way we're going to eventually calculate this volume of acid needed to reach the equivalence point is by using stoichiometry. Um, so I want to think about the hydrochloric acid for a minute. I know that that substance is going to behave as an acid, and according to Bronsted-Lowry, that means that it's going to donate an H+. So now let's think about the hydrogen carbonate for a minute. We know hydrogen carbonate could either lose the H+, plus it already has, and go back down to just carbonate, or I could gain an H plus and go up to H2CO3, to carbonic acid. Um, this is a substance that is actually amphiprotic that could do either or. However, here's the key thing. It's with this acid. And if we know that if the acid has to donate an H plus, then that means the hydrogen carbonate must be accepting that H plus. So if I was writing my reaction here, Here's what I would have shown. I would have put my two reactants together. I would have said, hey, I know the HCl has to donate an H+, meaning this HCO3 negative 1 is going to accept it. That would end up resulting in H2CO3 carbonic acid along with the chloride ion here. So now I can see that this is balanced, and I can also see that that means that there's a one-to-one -one ratio between my base and my acid. So now I'm ready to do my stoichiometry to figure out the equivalence point and what the volume of acid would be needed. So I'm trying to figure out here what volume of HCl would be needed to react the hydrogen carbonate. And remember the hydrogen carbonate uh, is the HCO3 negative 1, but I went ahead and converted the 30 milliliters here into liters. So then it told me it had a molarity of 0 0.05 molarity, 
So that's one liter is 0 0.05 moles of the hydrogen carbonate. I then am going to use my mole to mole ratio, my one to one ratio that we just figured out in our reaction. And so then I would say, hey, HCl has a molarity also of 0 0.05. So that's 0 0.05 moles for every one liter of HCl. And when I convert that eventually into milliliters, that gets me 30 milliliters of HCl needed to reach my equivalence point. Now, I know some of you are thinking, well, Miss Mercy, that's the same as this volume of hydrogen carbonate. Yes, it is, but it was only because I had the same molarity and a one-to-one -one ratio. Because all of those steps canceled out, it was the same volume. It's not always the same volume. So you have to be really careful there. So what that means is that if I was constructing a titration curve where I wanted to show where my equivalence point was at, where we see that vertical line kind of being created in our S shape of our titration curve, that would occur after I've added 30 milliliters of HCl. Now, I am going to be very careful when I construct this curve. Um, since the hydrogen carbonate is getting titrated, then what that means is the hydrogen carbonate is the analyte, and the hydrochloric acid I'm adding to it is the titrant. And so that hydrochloric acid is what I would have put down here on my axis the volume of 0 0.05 molar hydrochloric acid added. I'm going to put my pH over here on my vertical axis. Now let's talk about getting these points here for a minute. So it gives us some information here. It says sketch the expected titration curve given the following information. It first tells us the starting pH is 9.53. So what that means is that this is the pH of the hydrogen carbonate before I've added any HCl. And so what I've done is on my titration curve, I've come down here and said, well, hey, at zero volume of HCl added, I'm going to have that 9.53 pH. They gave it to me so I didn't have to calculate it. Okay, so then the next piece of information they give me is the pH at the equivalence point. At the equivalence point, once I've added that 30 milliliters in, that would get me a pH of 3.83. So what I would do is come down here to my titration curve. I would come to the 30 milliliters that we calculated for the equivalence point, and I would put me a marking at that 3.83 pH. Now, this is going to be vertical here at this area, so I kind of went ahead and started marking that to remind me that that's where that vertical point is going to be. So now, whenever I am doing a titration curve, there's always three points I want to have. Where I start where my equivalence point is at, and where my half equivalence point is at. So with that said, let's talk about that half equivalence point. There is a reason that here they gave you this KB value, okay? They want you to use that to figure out the half equivalence point. Now, first off, what volume does the half equivalence point occur at? Well, it occurs halfway to the equivalence point. If the equivalence point was at 30 milliliters and I half that, this is going to occur at 15 milliliters. But I need to know the exact pH point to put at that particular volume. So this is where I'm going to use my noggin. And I'm going to say, hey, I remember from all those titration calculations that we did that at the half equivalence point, the pH of a titration equals the pKa at the half equivalence. This is true. But I'm like, well, wait a minute here. They don't give me Ka because, well, this is unfortunately a base. They give me a Kb. But could I use a Kb to solve a Ka? Sure. I know that the Kw equals Ka times Kb. So what that means is that my Ka is equal to Kw over Kb. Now that would get you your Ka value, right? But I still need the pKa. Well, just like pH is the negative log of H, don't forget that the pKa is the negative log of Ka. So if I just take the negative log of Ka, and here's where I plugged in Kw over Kb. So again, I'm assuming I'm at 25 degrees Celsius, so I used 1 times 10 in the negative 14th, divided by my Kb value. 
So if I negative log that, that gets me a value of 6.36. So what that means is that at my half equivalence point at that 15 milliliters, I'm going to have a pH of 6.36. And so that's where I came on here and I put this data point right here. And you notice, I know that at that half equivalence point, we kind of get like a flattening out of my curve there. So now, if I wanted to go and construct this graph, I know that with this being a weak, strong combination, this is not going to necessarily be perfectly horizontal here. So I would kind of curve this along till I got to here. Okay. Then I'm going to come over here and give myself that vertical shape. And then I'm going to kind of flatten it out toward the end. Now, I don't know where it's going to end, so I'm just going to kind of curve it out to end it. If you were ever asked to sketch a titration curve, this is the kind of thing you would be looking for. And again, the three points you would always want to have is where your starting point is at, where your half equivalence point is at, and then finally, where your equivalence point is at. And you may need to do a stoichiometry calculation to figure out exactly what volume of titrant you need in order to reach the equivalence point itself. All right, I hope you're feeling good about doing a comparison of all of these titration curves. Uh, if you have any questions or need any help, please feel free to email me. Bye, guys.